Thanks very much. Um, so I guess I've got a bit of a graveyard shift here. So uh, I won't go through the, uh, the corporate structure of Tierra, because Tim and I. So well, we're not that big, but we've been a bit busy over the last few years. And it's really good that I've, at this stage of, a, of the presentations, because every one of you that presented before me have made my presentation a hell of a lot more relevant. So the way I do presentations is I check the audience, we're getting a bit sleepy. I pick out my agitator. I know there's one in here and you know who you are, Emily. So, and then the other ones, uh, I think I'm gonna shoot some questions at you. So you're gonna have to know what I'm talking about. And I've gotta try and describe something to you that's about 30 years of uh, university courses. I've gotta try and explain it in 20 minutes. So. I think this was pretty relevant all day long, yesterday and today. So we're all doing the same thing, aren't we? We're trying to find a way out of this hole that we're in. So we keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. So we manage to, you know, we monitor the rangelands, we understand the climate, and it happens again and again and again. We, we don't actually get it all together and come up with a result which realistically has to be more money in everybody's pocket we have to actually get some funds from somewhere. I mean, it was a pretty, pretty, pretty bad story here, Peter, saying, yeah, the fire, fire brigades, oh, sorry, the fire information um, might not be funded after June. What's that mean to the rest of you? Pretty bad. So, um, so Einstein himself had a, uh, an IQ of 160 to 180, pretty smart dude. Terence Tao, he's a uh, mathematician, he's an American, you know, he's an Australian-American university student out of Adelaide Uni. He's got a, he's a bright, currently the brightest rooster in the world, IQ of 230. Artificial intelligence is sitting just at the moment at 5,000. So we don't use that much. We use all of our own brains. We only use a little bit of our brain too, by the way. I'm over here because I would be afraid I'd be single digit in terms of intelligence. Okay. So what is it the Northern Territory needs? So I do this presentation to everybody all around the place and so I've, I've customised it for the Northern Territory. So we need to increase GDP. That's obvious because none of you are getting funds or you're scraping funds together somewhere, somehow to keep going each year. You need to raise your per capita GDP. So, so that means that Sarah doesn't have to be a bloody cook so she can put her kids off to school. So we have to now, there is a new convention in the world called the United Nations 17 SDGs. And there's 130, sorry, 193 countries in the world that are signatories to that. You can equate it to the Geneva Convention. So every country in the world signed up, well not every country in the world, signed up to the Geneva Convention. Treat your prisoners of war nicely. A few people didn't, but generally it was accepted that you treat prisoners of war nicely. So now we've got the 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. How are we going to keep this world going? Because if we don't start looking at how we do this, it's going to blow up. And now, all the big businesses, the investment funds, geez, all the investment funds around the world, they've, they've stripped it out. It's been going great. We've been logging, we've been agriculturaling, we've been rangelanding, we've been real estating, we've been developing cities and countries and so on. It's been fantastic. All of a sudden the realisation has come that we've got to start looking at how we're going to do this. So we, and this has never been done before, how through conservation and monetisation of conservation can we deliver on the Northern Territories and the world's natural capital assets? That is a truckload of money. I can tell you, it's, it's in a world that, if you had said to me a few years ago that Number one, I was going to uh, move from the country, I'm a country kid, into the city. I would have said, don't think so, mate. If you had have said to me that I'd be walking around after my dog picking up the dog shit and putting it in a plastic bag and in a bin, I'd say, I don't think so. And if you had have said I'd be dealing in billions and trillions and quadrillions, that does my head in. You have to Google those sorts of numbers. 
So I'll just go on to uh, introduction of natural capital, natural capital. I'll give a description of it. Can anyone tell me, and I'm going to ask this question directly at somebody, what is for IR? What's that stand for? Sarah? Anybody? There's some doctors and professors here. Hey? <laughs> no, no, there's an equal, you've got an equal there. It's, it's, it's called the fourth industrial revolution. And we're right in it now. We're just, just about to kick off. We're into it and we're starting to move through it. And it's the fifth industrial revolution coming. So we're going to use that, that knowledge and information, and we're going to use, we're going to create or be able to realise a return on an asset that we're sitting on, which is natural capital. We have to build, we have funding models. Who the hell is going to fund all of this? But we're talking in that quadrillions, trillions and billions, not millions. So we have to build digital platforms. We're going into the digital world now. This is the 4IR. We're going into the digital world. We have to have auditing. So all that information that you people gathered, you know, you're asking, you asked every, every presenter, so where can I get that? And some of you had it, some of you didn't. And then you have to, go be able, have to be able to go and get it and apply it to your patch. So we do it on a global status, then we bring it down to a country status, then we bring it down to a state status, then we've got to be able to bring it down to regional, social, you know, uh, shire, and to your farm or to your property or whatever you're doing to make a living. And if we can't do that, it's not going to work. So I'm going to talk about the first signed nature conservation agreement in the world and how do we do NCAs, Nature Conservation Agreements for the Northern Territory? Next one. So, definition of natural capital. Natural capital, natural capital would define as world stocks of natural assets, fantastic. And have a look at these, carbon. Was carbon a topic in all our discussions today? Yes, and yesterday. Water, every discussion was about water. What's water gonna do? These are all fractional components of natural assets. All, live, all living things, biodiversity. I don't care about biodiversity. I don't know if there's numbats here or not when I'm boring up that uh, highway. So that's actually, all of this is key, absolute key. Now if you go and talk to AWC, they're doing everything they possibly can to, you know, to look after nature capital, increase biodiversity and so on. But all of that, water, carbon, that's ecological goods and services. We now know, and it's a globally accepted methodology, that we can actually value the ecological goods and services, which is going to keep us alive beyond 2050. So that's, that's where we're at. So the objective here is we are, have built now a, all the digital platforms, we have the funding in place, and we're going to go about incentivising the conservation of nature capital so that anything that's called exploitation and it can take many forms. So we're trying to make a living on these rangelands, arid rangelands here in Central Australia with cattle. So we need to know, we've, it's called exploitation, but we have degraded the rangelands over time. This is not just you guys and girls, it's over time. So we're trying to arrest that slide, correct? So we have to make sure that you've got the funds and the income and the ability to actually do things yourselves, not not be relying on government or everything else. And nature capital is marine and terrestrial, so it's not just, and it's rainforests, it's uh, temperate forests, it's desert, you know, desert gardens, what we're in here. So it's all of those sorts of things together. Now, here's your four IR. Blockchain, fantastic. So let's just call Bitcoin out. That is run on blockchain technology. It uses artificial intelligence, that one there, and machine learning, and deep learning, which is you know, uh, synced with machine learning, and that's a digital currency. So, how many of you own Bitcoin? Why not? My business partner in Asia, he was offered 1,000 Bitcoin at five cents. So, how, not, how good is that? What would it be worth now? I traded 59000 yesterday. $59,000 US per coin. So you're trying to fix your landscape so that you can run more cattle, so you can grow more meat, so you can get a few dollars in your pocket. So look at where technology is going and where money is going to be. So tokenisation is another, another area. 
So we cannot do anything of the scale that we're about to do around the globe. So we're going to the Congo, Southeast Asian rainforests, and the uh, Central and Latin American jungles, the Amazon, and we're going to lock it up for 100 years in perpetuity, we'll call it, because if we don't stop the, the degradation of that, and we've done it in the past, we've gone to Indonesia and said, look, you numbnuts, what are you doing knocking your jungle down? You know, we, we need that. And they said, well, hang on, didn't you just knock all your stuff down in agriculture and everywhere else? You made a lot of money out of it. So that's what we used to use natural capital for, to make money. Clear it, log it, whatever, and we made lots of money. So an example of how it doesn't, hasn't been able to work was Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund gave them $1 billion to not log. Seven years later, they gave them 200 million, so here you go. They gave them 200 million and away they came. Seven years later, they tripled, doubled their logging rate. So Norway took the money back. When we use blockchain technology, that does not occur. There is no corruption and what is spent at this end, so a billion dollars comes in, here is a recipient and it's all verified on a blockchain. Everybody can look at it and say, oh, a billion dollars, no logging, fantastic, and you know that. So all the data that you're all gathering out there has to underpin a blockchain. We have to aggregate, collect it all. Data is going to be the meaning of life, and we have to have it all so that when you interrogate a blockchain or interrogate the other end of a blockchain, you can pull out all the data and knowledge and information knowing that where your fires are going to be, how bad it's going to be this year, or whatever it might be. Next one. <coughs> So, Tierra Australia and its global partners, it's a, a big call. So what happened was, uh, Tim and I got together, or we went to school together actually, he was a bit smarter than I was, but um, so we got together on this landscape rehydration, catchment function analysis, and that was great, and I thought, oh, Tierra Australia's going to be, we will we'll be a corporation instead of a corporation of two. So I said, Tim, you keep going with that, I'm going off to Asia to, um, to see how we can get some money together. It's taken six years so far. And so all these models that we're building is in conjunction with Harvard University, MIT, uh, Cornell, all the universities around the world, the smartest people in the world, building blockchain so that we can do this without corruption and we know where money comes from and goes to. So what, what's it gonna mean to us? That means the NT government and the people within the Northern Territory self-funded and financially independent. That's the goal, we have to do that. So I'm working in uh, Sabah, which is the most corrupt state in the most corrupt country in the world. That was a bit of an eye-opener when I first got there. So if we can do it there, we can do it here in Australia. But it's most importantly, land managers, which you're all custodians of, Charlie, the, uh, the Aboriginal fellow we had here the other day, He's got to actually benefit. We can't leave him aside. We can't leave anybody aside. We have to be all encompassing so that we all benefit from what we're the custodians of. Next one. So these, so these uh, shots are mine from uh, when I was taken into the jungles and that of Sabah. And I was many, many times, I thought I wasn't gonna come back out. So what we're trying to do is get everybody in the world, doesn't matter whether you are a desert garden custodian or a jungle, jungle custodian, we've got to transform the natural capital and we want to be able to be the conservationists. You know, we want that to be the peak of that, everything rather than the, uh, the poor cousin, here's a couple of bucks, go and catch a couple of numbats and give them a pat. So we've got to be, under the, under the conventions of what we're dealing with, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, 17 SDGs. That must become part of everybody's vocabulary because you will not get funds, you will not get rewarded for looking after nature capital unless you address the Sustainable Development Goals. And you are all a company or a corporation or whatever you might be, miners, whoever, it doesn't matter who you are, and I spoke to Brian about this, environmental, social and governance. So you must meet so corporations in the around the world must meet their ESGs. Otherwise they can't raise capital to develop a mine, to do whatever. They must address that and that. And so that's what the, the Northern Territory government has to be. So when they do, let's say for example, they, uh, they award fracking licenses or whatever it might be. We have to be able to analyze landscapes to make sure that is a fracking license worth 
you know, the nature capital it destroys or the potential to destroy a water table or whatever the negatives are on a, on a fracking operation. So we have to build platform or platforms and we've done that. We've got financial backing. So the Singapore government, they're going underwater. So they put up $100 billion. They said, find us, they manage, they're cashed up to a tune of a trillion. So they put up 100 billion and said, where's a green project? Where's something that's really good? And I'm pretty sure Aileron didn't come up. I'm pretty sure uh, Northeast Arnhem Land didn't come up. There was nothing came up because we have nothing. There was nothing around. So we started to build this nature capital thing. So um, we have to have global investment community. This is the billions and trillions. These are the people that have to give back now. They can't, they can't just keep going the way they are in an exploitive way. There will be some, but they can't keep going in an exploitive way. And they realise under the SDGs that they can't keep going. So now us here, who've been contributing to them and to our taxes and so on, they now become OPM, which is other people's money. Let's use them. It's almost like a socialistic thing I'm talking here, so I'm not a, I'm not a uh, zealot or anything. So we've got financial instruments, so we have to build digital platforms. Everything's going digital. It's not, it's not, um, it's gonna be, not gonna be business as usual. We can't manage something this big. So we have to have hardware, marine, terrestrial, natural, and build capital. So what are you guys sitting on? You're sitting on terrestrial um, nature capital. The Northern Territory, Northeast Arnhem Land, terrestrial and marine. So there's high, high value in all of that. So CIX has been built. You can actually Google that and, and put in CIX. And there's two parts to it. So we have carbon. Now, Tim and I have been working with carbon, carbon companies and so on, and we're just a little bit reticent to think, gee whiz, all this carbon? Is it true? Who verified it? And what's the methodologies that we have to follow? And so you're dealing with lots and lots of different carbon companies, but so what we want to be able to do is it has to be verifiable, has to be marketable. So we're about to do, we've got two million hectares of jungle in suburb. So we're about to put a, a, a REDS project over that and we can get anywhere between five tonnes per hectare and 100 tonnes per hectare. Our verification is we're working on 20 tonnes per hectare of CO2e, carbon, at $20 US per tonne and times two million. So that's how we work. So if we're a little bit unsure, we'll discount that so we don't put the whole asset forward. Here in Australia, what do we do? Point something of a tonne? So we're, maybe we're not good uh, carbon producers. We'll take it though, but we're good at nature capital and monitoring, managing, and, and looking after nature capital. So we've got an absolute network around the globe of those. Blockchain and, I, and AI and ML, we've got, we have to have transparency, transparency, integrity, quality, and we have to be able to audit all this. And then we have to put it up into the global market and say, now these are, these people on the trillions of dollars, not dumb investors. So we have to say, there you go, that's what you're getting. And once it's verified, I, I don't, I'm not sure if this presentation is going anywhere, but um, that there, if you can go onto YouTube and have a look at all of that sort of thing. So the, the uh, project marketplace, that's where our natural capital is gonna be done on nature-based solutions. Next one. So the reason I put up all the, I haven't put up any local pictures like everyone else is because this is being done in Sabah. So uh, being taken around the jungles by those people. So we have to have externally, external verification. We can't rely on one person pushing up a piece of data and saying, there, there you go. So we have to underpin it and we have to be able to securitize it and use those financial instruments. And we have to work on capital management, on uh, management plans for all NC, all carbon, conservation, economic, social, cultural, and related, uh, related uh, um, projects. Sorry, next one. So this is who, who we've got. So we, and I'll put the Northern Territory here, but it's, it's again, it's a, uh, it's an uh, organisation or a, uh, a government body that gets in between you as the custodian and us as the funders and verifiers, 
and we can't, we've got to eliminate that sort of thing. But the reason we're going to the Northern Territory Government is in the suburb government, most of the money goes to them and then they uh, distribute. It only can be distributed on according to blockchain so that it makes sure that Sarah gets it, Emily gets it, you know, everybody here gets to their proportion of input uh, the income. So they can continue on collecting data and so on. So these are the, so the eth ethical and ESG foundations, the green bonds and world wildlife and so on, they will give us money. When I'm talking billions of dollars, they'll just give it, they don't want to return. So then we go into governments and develop, developed countries, $2 trillion from the US just got put in, international corporate social responsible companies, the ESGs, where that's actually uh, corporate law, and we need to have mums and dads. I want to invest in it. And I want to know that the dollar that I put in is going to come back and actually make a difference. So we're the Global Tierra, and I'm heading up a uh, company called, a uh, Malaysian company called Global Nature Capital, Sindra Bahad. And we are cons we're the consultancy dealing with all of those sorts of things while well, bringing together the whole network. Next one, please. So this is the trading values of the uh, global economy at the moment. 133 trillion is the global economy. If we had blockchain in place before this was put up, that would increase by 25 to 50% in terms of contribution or the size of the global economy because it gets fed out, there's all sorts of people in there, the corruption and so on. So that could actually be close to $200 trillion if we had blockchain technology. The global bond market, so the global green bond market in 2018 was 380 billion. By the end of this year, it'll be one trillion. By uh, end of 2025, it'll be five trillion. The carbon market, so just looking at 5,000 companies on the, on the London and the New York Stock Exchange, market cap each of a billion, average of a billion, they are legally, they are legally bound to offset their emissions combined market cap of five trillion, only 2% of those companies are um, compliant. So therefore, you've got $16 trillion just to start with. And we want to be the beneficiaries of that. So next one, please. So you cannot build, manage, conserve, improve, or monetize anything without measurements. You people are doing a great job. Everybody's doing a great job with measurements. Next, please. Oh, actually, just go back. So over here, this is the island of Borneo, Sabah's up the top here. So they wanted to do REDS projects. We said, yeah, great idea. You know, you've got lots of jungle and you know, we'd, all we do is just tart it up a bit. You know that on the island of Borneo, there's 760,000 kilometres of logging roads. And so we all of a sudden thought, shit, there's nowhere near the jungle we thought. So how do we then fix up the logging roads? So we've got, you know, we've got to work out ways to do that. So our REDS project was this big, now it's this big, and we've verified that. Next, please. Um, so we use ALCES, which is what we want to be able to import into the landscape management and observation and uh, evaluation. So essentially, it's, uh, we're using GS, GS Web Delivered. It's been operating for 25 years. And we look at residential, with land uses, residential transport. Where do you put transport? Where's agriculture go? What's the value of agriculture and what we're doing versus knocking that out? You know, do we dam that or just let it run and let people go and have a look at it? What's the, what's the value of all of this? And then your natural disturbances. We've got to know those fires. We've got to know what climate change is doing to the landscapes. Socioeconomic, you know, employment, population, royalties, revenue. We have to know where it all goes and comes from. Next, please. See all the data we've got to collect? We have to collect every single bit of that data. So I'll just keep going with that. And it all has to go into our program. All of your data, we're gonna to come to you for that data because we wanna put it all into one place, into ALCES. We then simulate what the landscape is likely to, what it was, what it is now, and different scenarios, what it's gonna look like going forward. Next one. So, this is what we want, this is how we operate. So each of you, if you can imagine this in your home, or your office, or the government offices, or whatever it might be, all the data is in here. So if you want to interrogate it for 
Sarah, if you want to interrogate, what the hell do I do with this rehydration thing? Is it the same as uh, the property over the road there? So all that data's in here. So, and I mean, I, was, I thought it was a bit rude of um, Chelsea to uh, suggest that I get Emily's phone number and ring her at two o'clock in the morning. That was a bit rude, I thought. So what, this solves all of those issues. You've got the data, you paid for it all. So you're gonna have the data. And so you can interrogate it. And you can ring Emily at nine o'clock in the morning after she's um, had a first coffee. So that's what we want to be able to do. And we can put these anywhere. And the, the more data that goes in there, we use artificial intelligence, machine learning, the better the data becomes, the more solid it becomes. So we can make management decisions based on sound data. Next, please. This is exactly what we do with the, uh, the simulator. And this is what we did. We did this for Bali, actually. So Bali came up with, so we, we knew what it was then. It was a beautiful place to go. You would love to have been there. 2019, it wasn't so flash. It was getting a bit knocked around. So if Bali continues to 2069, if they do business as usual, that's where they're headed. If they do something that helps the country, or uh, the uh, state, then we might be able to maintain. What do they have to do to get on this? If they don't manage their nature capital, they don't have a drop of water by 2056. That's it. Next, please. And we do the same narratives here on this landscape. What's it look like in 1800? What is it now? And what are we going to do to go? That's just basically a, a summation of all the nature capital around the world, uh, around Southeast Asia, Australasia. Next, please. And if we have a look at Australia, we've got all sorts of different uh, areas and hectares of nature capital. Some of it might only be worth $50 a hectare or $100 a hectare, but we've got billions of hectares. So versus 4 million hectares in summer. Next, please. So if we have a look, if I, I just went and Googled a couple of things. So we've got Bush Heritage, we've got AWC, which are a couple of guys here, you'll see. We've got Forever Wild. You know, they're actually aggregating some nature capital. But they go and get philanthropic dollars and they fund their own research. That's really, really good research. <coughs> And the property is not far from here. One of the properties is not far from here. New Haven, I think it's called. So they were already starting to aggregate nature capital. So how do we get it under a, a, a conservation agreement and start making money out of it and start inputting money into the Northern Territory? Next, please. This has been put together over years. It's peer reviewed and so on. So open oceans, and these are the, a number of estimates or studies that have been done. And then this is the income that would be derived from that particular ecosystem or uh, a different type of ecosystem. And this is a, a coral reef, it's $126,528 per annum. That's what it, that's what it delivers. And your, your mangroves, and sorry, your, yeah, your mangroves and your uh, coastal wetlands, you know, these are the sorts of incomes you get. And you get down here to tropical forests, they're only 6,000 bucks. Temperate forests. We've got 16 million hectares sitting down at the bottom of Western Australia of the last and the largest temperate rainforest in the world. Next, please. So we go back to Sabah, 43,000 hectares of pristine forest, projected yearly income. T valuation, which you saw, $6,124. The 17 SGGs, we must work under that so we can actually generate that income. The investment is the area by the T valuation. We discount it, in this case, by 85%, split 70-30. Now, investment, investment companies in the past have all said, I tell you what, you get 10%, we'll keep 90%. How do you reckon? That's good? Wrong. So under the SDGs, we must take the lesser amount and the 70% must go to the custodians and people who are going to be doing this. So that's 20, just on 43,000 hectares, that's $27 million a year they're going to get. Next, please. So the Sabah government just signed 3.5 million hectares of tropical rainforest. Now we have to re-establish that in big areas so that we can actually get it going again. It was signed this month, last month, sorry, uh, this month. And what, as a result of that, they got an immediate injection of $10 billion into Sabah. It was the first mover advantage and the world said, wow, that is bloody fantastic. There was no return needed on that 10 billion. That was philanthropic and so on. Next, please. You, here's your SDGs, you must get to be get to know those. Now education, I heard here in the audience, I think Sarah, you pointed it out, 
it's not equitable at all. We have to be able to deliver equitable education to everybody. And employment and housing, you know, I live in a nice house. I've seen plenty of people that don't. So we have to be able to pay for that. We have to be able to put, pe put people into housing. Next, please. So the pillars of it, so it's going to have to be, it's not a case of, oh, yeah, here's some bush, oh, give me some money and we're out of here. It's globally, it must have legal bankability, commercial bankability, and is it verified? Is there that carbon there? Is it going to stay there for 25 years? Can we invest against it? What's the land use? What's the sovereign law? And so on. Next, please. So here's my favourite. You all came here bringing your silo along. Did you not? You did. I'll tell you that for free. So this has to stop. We have to integrate all of these. You must all operate off the same platform. You can't have your little bit of data. I'll get back to you. Don't worry about that. You can't have that. We have to have all this data at our fingertips. Next, please. It's around the table, basically. It's just a, a graphic of around the table. And you know, Indigenous people must be included. They can't be excluded. No one can be excluded under an SDG. Next, please. So the 4IR provides us the technology to operate at scale. The first NCA has been signed. How do we do it in the Northern Territory? Beginning immediately, we need to sign as many NCAs as possible right now to start locking it up. And we've got to be compliant with all of this stuff here. Next, please. So that was, uh, that's me there. That's my, one of my Malaysian mates. He's actually a Doosan. These are Murat tribes people. And uh, this bloke here is an expert on blockchain. And these two uh, Swiss tourists that just showed up. So their average income is $7,209 per annum. That's all they get. These guys, and Dr. Richard, who uh, Tim knows, we met, he's a, he's a very scholarly looking gentleman, and he informed me that they were actually, back in the day, they were the, they were the kings, they were the kingpins, they were headhunters. I have to say, we were headhunters, not cannibals, all right? So that was it. So we actually experienced the uh, life up in there and experienced their jungles and what they want to do, but they live in extreme poverty and 80% of the world's nature capital is under the custodianship of uh, Indigenous folk. Thank you.